In this video, I'm going to be talking about the Frankenstein lab-grown meat. So without further ado, let's get into it. As you've already likely seen in the headlines, lab-grown meat is here. The U.S. Department of Agriculture approved upside foods and good meat to produce cell-cultured meat, otherwise known as lab-grown meat. So let's first answer the question, what is lab-grown meat? Also known as cultured meat or cell-based meat, it is produced by culturing animal cells in a laboratory setting rather than raising and slaughtering whole animals. The process involves a small sample of living animal cells, typically from muscle tissue, and providing them with the nutrient-rich in vitro environment that allows them to grow and multiply. Lab-grown meat is considered an innovative solution to address some of the challenges associated with conventional meat production. It can also potentially reduce the environmental impact of agriculture, such as greenhouse gas emissions and land use as well as the ethical concerns related to animal welfare. Additionally, it may more offer a more efficient way to produce meat, potentially decreasing the risks of foodborne illness. While the technology and concept of lab-grown meat are promising, it's important to note that it's still in the early stages of development and has not yet reached widespread commercial availability. As with any emerging technology, ongoing debates and controversies surround its safety, sustainability, and potential long-term implications. I'm going to carefully cover each of these concerns in depth right now. So how is lab-grown meat made? Well, when I first heard of lab-grown meat, I didn't have a clue what the process entailed, but I was completely intrigued. So by doing comprehensive research, I discovered that these are the basic steps to growing meat in a lab. The first part is cell isolation and collection. A small sample of animal cells is taken usually through a biopsy without harming the animal. For chicken meat, the cells come from fertilized chicken eggs. This means that you can eat the meat of an animal that is still alive and completely unharmed with the exceptions for kosher and halal lab-based meat. It is real meat, but it was raised in a lab rather than on the animal. These collected cells are stem cells that have the ability to differentiate into muscle cells. And the next part is cell culturing. The isolated cells are placed in a bioreactor, sometimes called a cultivator. This machine is a closed and controlled environment that provides the cells with the necessary nutrients, growth factors, and scaffolding materials to support their growth and maturation. Wondering what scientists feed the meat? Well, it turns out that lab-grown meat is given an oxygen-rich cell culture medium that is made of vitamins, amino acids, glucose, inorganic salts, and other proteins. Now let's talk about the tissue formation of lab-grown meat. The cells multiply and fuse together to form muscle tissue, the meat's primary component. The tissue then undergoes a process of maturation to develop its structure and texture. And then lastly, harvesting the cell-based meat. Once the cultured meat reaches the desired texture and structure, it is harvested and processed. Sometimes the cell-based meat is combined combined with other ingredients to create familiar meat products like burgers, sausages, or nuggets. It takes about one to eight weeks to be ready to harvest. And if you're wondering what the turnaround is for chickens, it's about six to eight weeks for the most efficient producers. Looks a lot like minced chicken when extracted according to Andrew Noyes, who is the head of global communications and public affairs at Good Meat's parent company, Eat Just. Now let's talk about why I'm skeptical of lab-grown meat. Originally, when I heard this, I was like, you're out of your mind get out of here no way I nothing to do with this but of course I had to be fair so I asked some questions and did my best to find answers from both sides of the controversy here are my skepticisms and what I found out about each of them so is it more effective than traditional meats lab-grown meats certainly have the potential to be more effective than traditional meats but they aren't just there quite yet this method uses far less land water and resources like feed to produce the meat scaling is going to be quite the hurdle though currently upside can produce 50,000 pounds of meat per year and expand to 400,000 pounds annually with some modifications. As of 2020, the average person in the U.S. eats right around 264 pounds of meat a year, according to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. That means the upside facility could provide all meat needs for 189 people annually and up to 1,515 people after the modifications. And considering that 9 out of 10 Americans regularly eat meat, not to mention that we have 331.9 million Americans, I'm not sure how that would fare well for lab-grown meats in terms of supply and demand. You also have to consider the size of this facility compared to a traditional farm. Upside located in Emeryville, California is 53,000 square feet, equivalent to 1.2 acres. And even more impressively, this entire operation exclusively uses renewable energy. On the other hand, if you want to raise 50,000 pounds of beef, you would need 100 cattle on about 100 acres. That is assuming you raised 1,200 pound beef animals that yield a hot carcass weighing of 750, a cool 
full carcass weighing of 730 and then 500 total pounds of meat after being deboned and trimmed. For the Western United States though, even more acreage would be needed. In the state of Montana, on average, it takes about 10 acres to raise one animal unit. So it would actually require a thousand acres to produce the same amount of meat that Upside does in 1.2 acres. While I'm highly skeptical of how lab meat will scale, the future does look possibly promising. And of course, I don't expect it to replace traditional farming. Instead, I expect it will be a nice alternative that works alongside old fashioned agriculture. So the question that comes about is, will it become affordable? Well, the first lab grown burger cost $330,000 to make and was served at a news conference in London, England in 2013. Those of us who have built chicken coops and runs bought all the supplies to raise chickens and then the chickens themselves can sympathize. After all, many chicken farmers jokingly refer to their first egg as a $1,000 egg. Ivy Farm from Britain says it could reproduce lab grown meat for less than $50. Eat Just aims to reach price price parity with traditionally grown meats by 2030. But for now, prices are expected to be closer to $17 a pound. While some restaurants offer lab grown burgers for $9.80 each, it's still considerably more than typically grown grocery store meat. If you enjoy this content, please be sure to like the video and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also subscribe to our website, thehappychinkoop.com. If you subscribe using the link in the description, you'll receive a free ebook on the 10 best egg laying chicken breeds. All right. Another question people may ask is, will this week in our immune system. Since a single animal could hypothetically feed millions of people millions of pounds of meat, I can't help but wonder what it will do to our immune system. Isn't a diversity of animals with different diets, hormone levels, and climates better for our health? Will eating the same animal over and over weaken our immune system? Will it cause deficiencies or malnourishment? I haven't found much information on this aspect yet, though I anticipate more studies will give us a better idea of this in the coming years. What I did learn, though, is that lab-grown meat will seriously reduce the threat of antibiotic resistance. When beef and chicken are grown in labs, the risk of E. coli and salmonella dramatically drops, meaning that antibiotics will not play nearly as large of a role in agriculture. Currently, 80% of the antibiotics we produce in the U.S. are sold for meat and poultry production. Only 20% of antibiotics are intended for human consumption. So lab-grown meats could not only reduce the antibiotics we give our animals and our risk of E. coli and salmonella, but they could also help us cut down on dioxin poisoning in humans. And that poisoning can cause problems with hormones and reproduction like cancer, infertility, and birth defects. Dioxins are found in many food products, especially animal products. They usually come from the herbicides and pesticides used in the animal's feed. Dioxins build up in the fatty parts of animal products like eggs, farmed fish, beef, pork, and poultry. And did you know that a farmed salmon can have 16 times more dioxins than wild salmon? Once dioxins enter our bodies, they are hard to eliminate because they stay in our fatty tissue for a long time. Men cannot get rid of them at all, and women can only release some through breast milk, which might affect their babies. Unborn babies are especially sensitive to dioxins, so pregnant women are advised to eat less oily fish and dairy products. Many countries check their food for dioxins to prevent large contamination problems, but even with these efforts people who consume a lot of dioxins which is concerning due to the world health organization dioxins are just one example of harmful chemicals found in animal products other harmful toxins are arsenic melamine lead mercury and cadmium lab-based meats reduce or eliminate most if not all of these toxins so with all that being said it's just too early to tell. Let me know in the comments what you think of this developing story. That's gonna do it for us at the Happy Chicken Coop. Thanks for listening. If you find our content interesting, if you learn something new, be sure to like the channel, subscribe. And with that, I hope you have a great day and we'll talk to you soon.